if that's okay with everyone. Rohan, do you want me to wait a little bit more or do you want me to get started? I think it might be fine to just get started. Yeah, I think it gives us enough time and people will be streaming it. Terrific. It is my distinct pleasure today to um, welcome everyone to the virtual cardiovascular grand rounds and in particular to welcome Dr. Fatima Rodriguez, who is an esteemed cardiologist, um, assistant professor and health disparities researcher. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Rodriguez's background, um, which is quite impressive. Um, she went to UPenn for undergrad and then received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and her MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. She was also a Zuckerman Fellow from the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership. After that, she completed internal medicine residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and then arrived to Stanford in 2014, where she currently is. Um, she arrived there as a clinical fellow and served as chief fellow. Her research interests include many topics that are near and dear, especially relating to racial and ethnic disparities in guideline adherence, cardiovascular disease prevention, health promotion, and really leveraging technology to improve the care of diverse patients. She's authored over 120 peer-reviewed publications and has been a two-time winner of Stanford University's Alderman Award for Excellence in Research. Um, Dr. Rodriguez is funded by a Career Development Award from NHLBI and the McCormick Gallivan Faculty Award, and she serves as research director for an innovative telemedicine program in cardiology called CardioClick, and is director of population health of Stanford's systems utilization research. Um, most recently at ACC, she was the recipient of the very prestigious Douglas P. Zipes Distinguished Scientist Award. On a personal note, in these last few years during the pandemic, I have gotten to know um, Fatima um, through a few of the women in cardiology events. And one of the things I wanted to say is how many young cardiology fellows, medical students, even undergrads I have noticed who have thanked Fatima for her mentorship, for her leadership, for really trailblazing away um, a, a path in cardiology that they ne may not have seen for themselves otherwise. So I think she's a true role model, a true leader in cardiology. I love the research that she does. I think it's always exciting and cutting edge and um, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Spatz for that really kind introduction and hello to all my friends at, at Yale. I see Keith, Harlan, O'Yeary. So, um, and many more that just we've crossed paths in, in many stages in our career. I will now share my screen. And of course, I'm sure I'll have some technical glitches as is typical with Zoom. Um, and let me just go ahead and close my browser. Can everybody see that? Going to presentation mode, am I in the right mode? Yes? Yes. Erica, yeah, okay, great. So the title of my talk today is Cardiovascular Disease and Prevention in Hispanic Populations. We're really gonna focus around the concept of the Hispanic paradox that many of you may have heard about and trying to understand some of the background and to see if it is actually correct. These are my disclosures, uh, which are not relevant to today's presentation, but I will also disclose that it is five in the morning in, in California, which is actually a good time before my kids wake up, but I do wanna give that heads up in case I'm not my usual energy level. The learning objectives, um, which are part of the, of the CME points are to explore the cardiovascular disease uh, Hispanic paradox. And we'll talk about that for most of the presentation. A major take home point of this talk is to understand the heterogeneity of cardiovascular disease risk factors and outcomes. And if you take one thing from today's talk is that there is so much more heterogeneity between the same population than uh, across different populations. To consider acculturation and language and factors when caring for Hispanic patients in our cardiovascular medicine practices. So try to be a little bit practical about how we care for our growing Hispanic patients in our clinics. And this is an outline of the presentation. We'll start off with a patient case. Um, many of you know Dr. Bob Harrington, who is a chair of medicine at Stanford. When I came to Stanford in 2014, I was paired with Bob in cardiology clinic. And our first patient was a Spanish speaking older gentleman, Mr. E. I was very excited to continue caring for Spanish speaking patients in cardiology. He was 69 years old, a Mexican with a history of multivessel coronary artery disease that was not amenable to further interventions per Dr. Harrington. 
He had end-stage liver disease secondary to NASH, cirrhosis, esophageal varices, frequent upper GI bleeds that required interruption of anticoagulation, and advanced uh, kidney disease. Equally important, he was non-English speaking, and even in Spanish had a very low health literacy. And he had a large supportive family. In my very detailed fellow assessment of his status, he endorsed having um, worsening angina, which was starting to become unstable. And I obtained this, this EKG, and you can see by the blurriness that it's a real EKG. Um, and he actually had dynamic T wave changes, ST depressions throughout. And I was very proud of myself. I said, let's send this patient to the emergency room. In the emergency room, he was actually diagnosed with ACS, was taken to the cath lab. And this, I promise, will be the only cath film I show in this presentation. But basically, he just had severe three vessel disease that was not amenable to intervention. And they recommended medical therapy. What is very impressive of Mr. E is that nine years later, he is still my patient. He is still going. And as we go through today's presentation, I want you to think, what are potential factors that explain why Mr. E is doing better than expected, despite his severe chronic medical conditions and adverse social circumstances? By way of background, over 62 million individuals in the United States identify as Hispanic. And by 2060, the US Census estimates that one in three Americans will be of Hispanic Latino origin. Yet the data on the health of this, for these populations, particularly the heterogeneity within these populations remains sparse. And the basis for studying the social determinants of health is really the clear social gradient in health with improvement of whatever the socioeconomic metric that you study, whether that be income, education, social position, or occupation. As that gets better, the health status of populations in general gets better. Many of you are familiar with the Whitehall study, which is really a famous epidemiological study of 18,000 British civil servants that showed the association between social class and mortality. So in England, in the social service, the administrative class is considered the highest class. And as you go down social classes, you see an increase in overall mortality. Even more interestingly, this figure here shows that the extent of the relative risk of heart disease explained by traditional risk factors really varies by social class. And a larger portion of the risk is unexplained by traditional risk factors that we care for at clinic, like high blood pressure, smoking, and high cholesterol. And the authors poignantly conclude, a man's employment was a, was a stronger predictor of his risk of dying from coronary heart disease, and again, the more familiar risk factors. Fast forward to present times, and we know there's been a very strong um, interest in understanding the social determinants of health, structural racism, and the mechanisms that underpin the development and progression of cardiovascular disease. So with that background, I'd like to now define the Hispanic paradox some of you may be familiar with. What the Hispanic paradox is, is really an epidemiological observation that despite having lower levels of education, income, and employment, and other social factors that we really always associate with poor health, Hispanic individuals experience lower mortality as compared to other groups. And this is true across all cause mortality, is true across um, um, cardiovascular disease and even things like maternal mortality. This is recent data from the American Heart Association looking at cardiovascular disease mortality by race and ethnicity. And we can see here that death trends are, are going down for all racial ethnic groups in this data. And here in the green line, we see that Hispanic individuals have lower cardiovascular disease mortality and averages compared to black and non-white uh, and white individuals. This is data that was just published by the Global Burden of Disease um, group in the Lancet, again, showing differences in life expectancy by race and ethnicity. Here in the green line, we see white individuals and in the yellow, we see uh, Hispanic Latino individuals. And again, see that the average life expectancy increased by three years for this population over 20 years. And again, it's much higher than for, for white individuals and for black individuals. I will say this is data before the COVID pandemic and we'll get to that at the end of the talk. This is recent data from Dr. Caraballo, uh, mentored by Dr. Harlem Kronholz, 
um, that you all know as one of your, your leading researchers at Yale, showing that there is differences in multimorbidity, which is defined as more than two current uh, chronic conditions. And here again, in the green line for Hispanic individuals, you see that over 20 years, the prevalence of multimorbidity, again, is actually lower among Hispanic individuals than compared to white individuals in the purple, and notably compared to black individuals in red. But what Dr. Um, Harlan Krumholtz and Dr. Carballo showed again in this paper is that there still is a pretty prominent economic gradient, even within the same race ethnic group. And again, it's hard, it's hard to see, but in the green line, we can see that lower income Hispanic individuals, even though they experience a lower estimated multimorbidity prevalence, um, that is higher in lower income groups as compared to the medium and high income groups. So where was this observation first noticed? Beginning in the 1950s, before the census included information on race and ethnicity, Spanish surnames were used to identify individuals of quote unquote Spanish descent. And they noticed that in Texas, individuals with Spanish surnames had lower mortality from heart disease than groups than other groups. And this was an op epidemiological observation. Years later, many researchers coined this term, this epidemiological paradox, the Hispanic paradox. And in this paper from Texas, they write, despite methodological limitations, it can be concluded with some certainty, again, these are words that we don't typically see in epidemiological papers, that the health status of Hispanics in the Southwest is more similar to the health of whites and that of blacks, although socioeconomically, the status of Hispanics is closer to that of blacks. So what explains this potential Hispanic mortality advantage or the Hispanic paradox? The first is statistical immortality. Is this just bad math? Are we counting some people in the denominator but failing to count them in the numerator? And that's certainly possible. Or is it the salmon bias? There's some data that um, Hispanic immigrants may go back to their country of origin to die. So again, we failed to count them in the numerator for mortality statistics. Or is it acculturation? Is there something about the role of culture for Hispanic communities that is protective to cardiovascular health and outcomes? Or is it residents in enclaves? We know, for example, in Hispanic individuals that residential segregation may not have as severe a disadvantages as for other groups. Or is it health behaviors? In general, Hispanic individuals in the United States, for example, have much lower rates of smoking than other groups. And then there's the idea of the healthy migrant that healthier immigrants are coming to the United States as compared to the host country. So we'll talk about some of these potential theories in this presentation. Now I wanna shift gears a little bit and, and give you some, an overview of the importance of considering Hispanic heterogeneity. But before we get any further, let's define what we mean by the term Hispanic, Latino, Latinx. And it really refers to individuals of any race who have origins in Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, or really any other Spanish speaking countries. And Hispanic individuals, as I'll show you in the next couple of slides, vary tremendously across cardiovascular risk factors, socioeconomic status, acculturation, where people live, and all these impact cardiovascular disease risk factors and subsequently outcomes. But when we study these groups as one large homogeneous group, we may fail to fully capture the burden of disease across these populations. And there was a, a paper led by Carlos Rodriguez in 2014 by the American Heart Association, again, really calling to action the importance of looking at Hispanic heterogeneity through the lens of not only um, country of origin, but also immigration patterns, acculturation. So what is acculturation? Acculturation is the process in which an immigrant culture adopts the behaviors, beliefs, and attitudes of the host culture. And in general, for the Hispanic community, Lower acculturation, so retention of your, of your uh, country of origins culture, results in lower cardiovascular disease risk, although this is not true across all acculturation metrics, and there's often a lot of heterogeneity even within acculturation. And this is thought to be because as immigrants, in particular Hispanic immigrants, uh, uh, settled to the U.S. norms, they may adopt unhealthy behaviors. This is particularly true around diet. And there are a lot of theories, again, trying to explain the Hispanic paradox with some protective role of, of diet, the protective role of culture um, and less stress and social isolation. 
So how do we measure acculturation in research? We'll see that in a lot of the, using the larger data sets, we tend to use a crude measure of acculturation, like nativity status, are you foreign born or US born? And then sometimes if you have data, you can determine the length of residence in the United States. Generational status, one that is used very frequently and is very practical, particularly for, for clinical use, is language, English proficiency. And then there are several validated acculturation scales that are available in NHANES and other data sets, such as the short acculturation scale. So until recently, much of our data from Hispanic health has been from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that many of you are familiar with, or NHANES, that mostly oversampled intentionally Mexican Americans. I'll say that the most recent versions of the NHANES documents actually do disaggregate into Mexican individuals, and then they have other. But understanding this limitation of recurrent data, the NHLBI developed a large prospective longitudinal cohort, the Hispanic Community Health Survey, or the study of Latinos, also known as SOL. And this is, again, a large cohort of over 16,000 self-identified Hispanic Latinos throughout four regions in the United States, as shown in this map. Um, so San Diego, Chicago, the Bronx, and Miami, where I'm from. And this is really meant to be a very deep dive into the social cultural factors and acculturation that are associated with the development and progression of disease. And there are six subgroups of particular interest that are oversampled based on these geographic sites of uh, Mexican individuals, Central American, Dominican, Puerto Rican, South American, and Cuban. And this is some, uh, uh, some data from the original baseline cohort, and there's now a different uh, updated data. But again, just showing the high prevalence of cardiovascular disease risk factors across groups. But there is some heterogeneity by country of origin. Most participants in the SOUL study have at least one cardiovascular disease risk factor, but particularly among Puerto Rican and Dominican individuals, and particularly women, we see very high rates, for example, of obesity. I'm a preventive cardiologist clinically, so I was very excited that they're doing a lipoprotein A sub-study. And in general, Hispanic individuals actually have much lower lipoprotein A levels as compared to other groups that we know have higher levels, such as Black individuals, South Asian individuals, and, and even in general, average lower than white individuals. But what this, um, this is an abstract that was just presented at, at ACC. What they found, again, is that there's significant heterogeneity in the lipoprotein A level at baseline, just based on country of origin, you can see the different distributions with Dominican individuals having much higher uh, median LPA levels as compared to Mexican individuals. For those of you that are um, echocardiographers, there's also another study called ECHO-SOL, which is an ancillary study of the Hispanic Community Health Survey led by Carlos Rodriguez, which is really trying to very deeply phenotype the echocardiographic parameters um, from US Hispanics. Because again, all of our data of what is normal right now is based on limited population studies. And what this cohort is trying to do is really deeply phenotype cardiac structure and function and showing association with cardiovascular risk factors. And again, here are just a, a few examples of some of the type of publications coming from this. Again, very high burden of prevalence of diastolic dysfunction, LVH, um, using current cutoffs and definitions. And they're repeating now to, to see how these change over time. Again, as, as a preventive cardiologist, I spend a lot of my time thinking of ways to better uh, risk stratify individuals with the prevalence and, and risk factors for ASCVD outcomes. And one thing that we use a lot clinically is coronary artery calcium. Data from MESA shows that, again, Hispanic individuals on average actually have a lower prevalence of coronary artery calcium after adjusting for age, crime, and cardiovascular risk factors. The, these cohorts have also shown significant associations between acculturation, socioeconomic positions, and CAC. And in general, again, the lower your socioeconomic position, and you're lower the acculturation, the lower levels of CAC, and that's what has been shown in the MESA study. Under the mentorship of Dr. David Marin, we were really interested in seeing if this held true across different populations that again, may not have um, a low socioeconomic position. So this is data from the Cooper Center Longitudinal Study. 
And this uh, is individuals that in general spoke, had very high educational levels, predominantly spoke English, and they were participating in a preventive cardiology follow-up clinic and what this graph shows is that despite very high rates of cardiometabolic risk factors in Hispanic individuals, overall, there's no difference in subclinical disease as measured by CAC by Hispanic ethnicity. So there's no protective role of Hispanic ethnicity in the higher educational levels. And in fact, for women, we actually see higher levels of coronary artery calcium after prevalence. So I've just given you a lot of conflicting data. Is acculturation detrimental to cardiovascular health? So different acculturation metrics may yield conflicting results. Higher acculturation is associated with adverse cardiovascular risk factors in general, but not necessarily clinical outcomes. And there's a fluidity in the acculturation process that is not routinely captured. As we talked about in, in a lot of these studies, we use very crude metrics such as are you foreign born or you as born? And the role of acculturative stress remains understudied in this population. And again, that's a big uh, topic area for the sole cohort. It's also important to consider the, the role of intersectionality. When we think about Hispanic women, for example, the role of young Hispanic women, ethnicity, gender, and we found that there's a high prevalence of metabolic syndrome in, in young Hispanic women, and this is work um, that we did when I was a, a medical student at Brigham and Women's Hospital under the mentorship of Joanne Foody, and that young Hispanic women experience higher in-hospital mortality once they're hospitalized for an acute myocardial infarction. There's been a lot of growing data showing that um, Hispanic women also face adverse pregnancy outcomes and they have very low levels of optimal cardiovascular health, particularly during pregnancy. So now let's switch gears and go back to mortality. Is the Hispanic cardiovascular disease mortality advantage real? So we did this by using data from the National Center for Health Statistics, multiple cause of death files, and not only looked at cardiovascular disease in general, but also looked at disaggregated cardiovascular disease. So looking at ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, I don't list it here. But we also looked at causes of death from heart failure and hypertensive uh, death. And this is how Hispanic ethnicity is ascertained in the U.S. Census, if you haven't seen this. And this is actually still the way it's ascertained in the 2020 Census. So this is a separate question from race. And I'll say, is this person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? And then it, they give you the option of having the three largest uh, groups in the United States, which are Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, and then you can fill in other subgroups. And Hispanic ethnicity in mortality records, there's some concerns that there's could be ethnic misclassification. Sometimes this is filled by the funeral director. But in general, several studies have shown that the misclassification in death records is actually fairly minimal. And it's estimated to be around 5%. So this is what we found. In general, Hispanic individuals when lumped together under all Hispanic are about 10 years uh, younger their time of cardiovascular death and non-Hispanic white individuals. But again, there's a lot of heterogeneity by major subgroup. So Cuban and Puerto, uh, Cuban individuals are older. And again, Mexican individuals, which are the largest subgroup are younger and as are Puerto Rican individuals. Not surprisingly, we saw from the Seoul study that there's differences in cardiovascular disease risk factors by subgroup. Cardiovascular disease mortality also varies by subgroup. And this is when we look at all cause cardiovascular disease mortality. I'll draw your attention to the orange line, which is all Hispanic. And again, the Mexican individual is in the teal. And you can see that essentially, especially for men, these lines overlap. So a lot of the data that we have on his, the Hispanic mortality advantage really is around um, Mexican American individuals. So again, they tend to overlap. You could start seeing the lines separate a little bit and see higher mortality for Puerto Rican and Cuban individuals. But when we look at cause specific cardiovascular disease mortality, like ischemic heart disease mortality, we see that these lines start to separate. And in fact, Puerto Rican and Cuban individuals have higher ischemic heart disease mortality than non-Hispanic white individuals. Again, suggesting that this Hispanic paradox may not be accurate for certain groups. And again, we see that the all Hispanic and Mexican lines are superimposed. 
When we look at cerebrovascular disease, the story changes and becomes quite interesting. We see that Mexican-American individuals, again, in the T line actually have higher mortality than compared to the other groups. And this data has also been shown in, in other cohorts like the Northern Manhattan Stroke Study. So it looks like for at least for Mexican individuals, the rates of stroke mortality, especially at young ages, are higher. So what can we conclude from this? Fewer Hispanic individuals die when studied in aggregate, but they die at younger ages. So maybe just looking at crude mortality is not the best way to look at this. We may want to look at things as years of potential life loss for other markers of premature mortality. Puerto Rican and Cuban individuals experience more ischemic heart disease deaths in general, while Mexican individuals are more likely to die from stroke, and we really saw those lines separate. There are, of course, limitations with using death record data, but some studies have suggested that the misclassification um, is, is by race ethnicity is actually not as high as we would think. It's also critically important to remember that there's significant geographic heterogeneity of where Hispanic individuals are coming from in, in South and Latin America, but also where people live in the United States. This is a very dramatic example, again, showing the importance of the built environment. These are pictures um, from Santa Fe, Mexico City. And this is the same picture, again, showing that just right next door, you can see the different opportunities people have to be healthy and have good health outcomes. So we asked the question, are Hispanic enclaves protective? Could that potentially explain some of the benefits of, the, of, his, of Hispanic health? And much like for, for Black individuals, Hispanic individuals tend to live only in certain parts of the United States. We see here, again, largely, um, there's some places in Florida, uh, California, again, the, the Southwest, uh, high concentration, but not so much in other parts of the United States. So you're probably wondering what the Hispanic population is in your area. So this is uh, in, in New Haven, Connecticut. Again, the Hispanic population is around 20% is a little bit higher than the national average of about 18% across the country. Where I live in, in Santa Clara County, it's about uh, 30% in California. So our hypothesis was that Hispanic ethnic density would be protective to cardiovascular health, but unfortunately that is not what we found. We found that as the proportion of Hispanic individuals in a county increased, the age adjusted mortality for more, it actually increased as well. And this was true for Hispanic individuals and non-Hispanic individuals. Of course, Hispanic ethnicity in itself is not a risk factor for higher mortality, but we know that there are certain factors of these counties where Hispanic individuals live that are associated with poor cardiovascular health. So the Hispanic living in ethnic enclaves, at least defined in this crude measure of density of population density is unlikely to fully explain the Hispanic mortality advantage. And there are several confounding adverse effects of where you live and again, where people immigrate to this country. And what I didn't show, but there's also significant heterogeneity of by Hispanic country of origin. So for example, being a Cuban individual in Miami may be very different than if you were from a different eth uh, ethnic background or country of origin. We also know that healthcare access and environmental factors that are not measured routinely in this epidemiological data are associated with worse clinical outcomes in these counties. So I wanna conclude with spending a, a few minutes talking about clinical considerations as we care for our Spanish speaking Hispanic patients and cardiovascular clinics. So I'm a preventive cardiologist, as I said, and many times we're trying to assess risk um, in individuals for primary prevention that have, may have a high risk of cardiovascular disease. And currently the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology recommends using the pooled cohort equations for risk assessment that contain the, the highest yield traditional cardiovascular risk factors as listed here, your age, your gender, cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking status, and race. But what actually happens when you have an individual that's Hispanic or Asian, which is a lot of patients actually that I care for in my clinic um, here in the Bay Area, the pool cohort equations default to those of white individuals. So there is no separate pool cohort equation for Hispanic individuals. The 2018 uh, cholesterol guidelines actually explicitly called out that there is no separate pool cohort equation for Hispanic Latino individuals. Um, and again, they recommended if African-American ancestry is present to use the full cohort equation for black individuals and to consider the role of heterogeneity 
as well as acculturation, which I thought was was great. And again, they call out explicitly that there's so much more heterogeneity in risk within the same group than be, than between different groups. Using data from a large healthcare system in Northern California, we again showed that in general, the pool cohort equation overestimates cardiovascular disease risk by about 20 to 60%. And this is true across all populations, but there is significant heterogeneity. Again, and this is showing the calibration and the events, the predictive versus observed events by country of origin with better performance among Puerto Rican Hispanic individuals that have higher events. Our group is interested in how can we build better models for diverse populations. And turns out that, that machine learning models can improve prediction of ASCVD events. And largely that's because a lot of patients in our electronic health records are missing uh, data necessary for PCE calculations or maybe ineligible because they're too young for a uh, numbers out of range. And this is particularly true among Hispanic populations in this, pop in this cohort. So every time I give a presentation about this, people will say, was well, it just genetics? Can we just look at things like polygenic risk scores or ancestry? And this is work uh, led by Sho Clark in our group as a preventive cardiologist, again, showing the dramatic uh, lack of data really on, on every group that's not from a European ancestry, but again, very few of the genetic uh, databases actually contain any data on Hispanic uh, and Latin American individuals. Again, this is data uh, from Dr. Clark that will soon be published in the Circulation Disparities Edition that shows that in the Million Vets program, with this, which is data from the Veterans Health System, there is so much more heterogeneity among Hispanic individuals, and you can see that by the scatter plot as compared really to any other group. So trying to ascribe just one genetic ancestry or one kind of foci, and again, this is not my area, that's why I don't, I don't know the details, but that that is, it could be problematic. And the pool cohort equations and adding this to the pool cohort equation may not actually improve the performance. This is work led by Dr. Uh, Ashish Saraju, who's, who's now at the Cleveland Clinic, showing the underrepresentation of Hispanic individuals in our clinical trial evidence. And again, this is the cholesterol clinical trials. So he showed that compared to the US Census, Hispanic trial participation was 58% of expected. Your chief of, of cardiology, Dr. Velasquez, is, uh, is very interested in improving the representation of diverse groups in clinical trials. And we've done some work trying to brainstorm about what are the best ways to get diverse part participants and particularly Hispanic individuals to participate in clinical trials. And not only is this the right thing to do so that individuals who have the disease are represented in clinical trials, but it's also going to be required. And we know that all of our leading journals are going to have an enrollment table that, again, tells you the if you're not able to meet your enrollment goals, you should have an explanation, particularly for these uh, underrepresented populations. We know that limited English proficiency is a, is a critical risk factor for cardiovascular uh, disease access and outcomes. And again, it's a very common uh, issue that we deal with in our clinic. And it's very important that we define limited English proficiency well. So this is not people who necessarily have to be fluent, but if you speak English less than very well, that is LEP. And there are legal mandates to provide interpreter services. This is a topic that is very dear and near to my heart because I was an interpreter actually before I went to medical school. So I always spend a lot of time with our medical residents uh, and, and students explaining the importance of using an uh, interpreter and not relying on family members. When I was a medical student at, in, at Harvard, we did a study looking at anticoagulation outcomes and how limited English proficiency patients, even in a clinic that had very high levels of time and therapeutic range, um, was associated with adverse outcomes. And this was, again, explained by communication barriers. Telemedicine is something that has come up over and over again during the pandemic and it's here to stay. But again, there's been a lot of studies showing that telemedicine may be problematic for non-English speakers. And again, this is true for many of our Hispanic patients. I was just in clinic last week and my uh, older Hispanic patient was just like, I'm not doing this, but you can do it and you can do it, but it just to develop a workflow for telemedicine. And what did this mean? It meant working with the medical assistant beforehand to try to make sure she had the connection, enlisting family members when necessary to connect people to video platforms. And not all encounters are appropriate for telehealth. 
We also need to do a better job of confirming the language proficiency of clinicians. Uh, for example, at Stanford, we now all have to take a test, even if you're fluent in Spanish, to before you, you can um, provide telehealth in, to, to patients in, in Spanish. If not, an interpreter is automatically linked to your visit based on patient preference. This is a study from Kaiser Health in Oakland showing that it is actually very possible to successfully connect to video visits if you use um, medical assistance support for these visits. Again, a little extra investment to really improve the quality of the visits. So I wanna conclude, and I don't know if Keith Churchill is still on, on the call, but with discussing structural racism and structural inequities um, as fundamental barriers to poor health. And again, uh, Dr. Churchill led this initiative and I was really proud to be part of this because it really called out structural racism as the driver of health disparities. And there's no better example of structural inequities than the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This is data from the COVID-19 Cardiovascular Disease Registry from the American Heart Association, showing the dramatic overrepresentation of both Black and Hispanic individuals in the registries. And again, you can just see compared to the local census data, uh, what the typical representation are in these SIMP codes and then the actual hospitalized patients. This is data showing the mortality, um, which over 50% of the deaths in this registry early in the pandemic occurred among Hispanic and Black individuals. And particularly in Hispanic individuals, they were much younger. They were about 10 years younger than other groups. In our own Stanford healthcare system, we found very high levels of positivity and continue to find this pattern among Hispanic individuals as compared to other groups. And a lot of times these are incidentally picked up in, in our emergency room. And of course, Hispanic ethnicity is not itself a risk factor, a biological risk factor for COVID-19 infection, but it is all the structural factors, all the structural inequities that have led to this dramatic overrepresentation of COVID-19 in this population because of the overrepresentation is an essential health, not only health workforce, but other workforce and inability to isolate when sick. And I'll conclude with talking about the, the reversal of the Hispanic paradox. This is the data uh, from LA County, again, showing that between 2019 and 2020, there has been an increase in Hispanic mortality. And this is not only from COVID-19, but this is all from all the other diseases that have maybe been undertreated during the COVID-19 pandemic, which includes diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We looked at the same trend in national data and again found that the Hispanic mortality advantage has been decreased by about 50% in between just these two years. And this varies again on geographic region. Most counties have lost the, the Hispanic mortality advantage um, as compared to, to prior years. So finally, I wanna end with a positive note. This is Herman Taylor, who has an SFRN from the American Heart Association really focused on the concept of resilience. And, the, and he's studying and his group is studying why certain individuals do better than expected and really trying to deeply phenotype these individuals in the Atlanta area. And I think we should do the same for Hispanic individuals. If there is a true health advantage for some things and in some populations, we should also study that and try to leverage those uh, maybe factors around resilience and protective factors, just as much as we study the adverse factors. So to conclude, why did Mr. E do better than expected? I'll tell you that he is still my patient again, nine years later. Um, he's had COVID multiple times, initially early in the pandemic, and I was really worried he wouldn't make it given his advanced coronary disease and his comorbidities, but he always seems to pull through and do better, and do better than expected. Part of it is familismo, you know, this concept of taking care of the elderly patient, of your elders in, in a lot of Hispanic cultures and his family has been very involved he actually lives really close to Stanford Healthcare in East Palo Alto, resilience and immense social support. So in conclusion, Hispanic populations are not monolithic. There is significant heterogeneity in cardiovascular disease risk outcomes by country of origin, acculturation, where individual lives. And health advantages across these populations need to be studied, but they may not apply uniformly as we showed. And we have to keep reevaluating our notions about cardiovascular health and disease. 
the Hispanic paradox is likely not static. And there's alarming trends in childhood obesity, diabetes, metabolic risk factors that are likely going to translate to worse outcomes in this population. And of course, the aftermath of COVID-19. We need to not just focus on mortality, even for my patient, Mr. E, who spends a lot of his time in a hospital. And that's also equally important to study the role of disability in these outcomes. And of course, there's important intersectionality between race, ethnicity, gender, and age. Our group is focusing on gathering better data, more granular data, particularly disimportance and disaggregation of Hispanic groups, of Asian groups, and other groups. You can never start too early in cardiovascular disease prevention, so really focusing upstream, um, really in preschool, community engagement for health interventions. And as we focus on increasing diversity in clinical trials, we really need to design for diversity from the beginning in the planning stages. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my, my wonderful research group of students and collaborators and mentors, our Stanford Preventive Cardiology section, our funding sources, and these little wild things that are still sleeping, fortunately. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm delighted to take questions now. Thank you so much for a fabulous talk. Um, I see Dr. Velasquez is on camera, so I will turn it over to him for the first question. Uh, well, Fatima, wonderful talk, and thank you so much for joining us so early in the morning. And, uh, you know, um, it's amazing when kids sleep like that. It's, uh, it's a gift. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I have two questions. Um, really, um, first of all, thank you for leading this, this focus. Uh, I think this is incredibly important and uh, increasingly important as, you know, um, you know, Hispanic population becomes a majority minority, uh, so to speak in, in, in our country. Um, what is your thoughts about, um, kind of, uh, a central biological paradigms. And I, and I, you mentioned, uh, life protein little a, um, you, you also, you know, I, I want to get your thoughts on airborne pollution, both indoor and outdoor air pollution, and how that relates to uh, these uh, um, differences among uh, different ethnicities. Um, that's that's one question, a more biological question. The second one is more kind of just your thoughts about, you know, as you, you know, have embarked on this career path. Um, I think the acculturation issue is something that I've found very interested, interesting for, for decades now. Um, but at some level, I, I don't know if it's been incorporated in, in our scientific paradigms and our research programs. And I wonder as we move increasingly towards kind of more um, uh, you know, implementation science uh, approaches in, in, uh, in our cardiovascular research, how you envision uh, integrating, you know, culturation measures into that, into that paradigm, so. so. So great question. So the first question is about potential biological underpinnings. And, you know, we, I showed early that there's a the really nice review in um, circulation research, uh, just showing that the potential biological mechanisms showing adverse stress and social determinants of health leading to cardiovascular disease progression and outcomes. Here we may have a, fl a flip situation that despite all these adverse social situations, people are still doing well. And I think that that's what Dr. Herman Taylor is studying in the, in the MECA study again, which is that we don't, those outcomes are, are different in black populations, but I think we need to look at that also in the Hispanic population. Like are there differences in our stress response and our HPA access activation that are potentially protective? Sometimes uh, when I've given this talk at, at other places, sometimes people have told me it's something about the diet. Maybe there's like something protective in beans and like the bio, like what people are eating that could result in the Hispanic paradox. But of course, this is not true across all populations. And again, the, the heterogeneity is very important. Um, in terms of like a, a gene and some ancestral mechanism, I think there's too much heterogeneity to pinpoint that to, to say it's ancestry. And um, my again, my colleague, Sho Clark, using, uh, he's really, really focusing his career on that and trying to understand the diversity and genetic signals. Um, for your second question, which is measuring acculturation, so this is really interesting. And I think, again, if we don't measure it and we don't capture it, we can't study it. So the simplest one, and I think a very valuable one as we think about individuals' interactions with the healthcare system and research environments is language, right? Are we, 
we're capturing limited English proficiency and are we doing a good job at that? Or in our electronic healthcare systems, uh, socioeconomic factors, social determinants of health are sometimes captured, but not routinely. So I think we could capture that uh, more in more detail. The short acculturation scale is, is very short. It's five questions. So again, I think in, in research studies and clinical trials, it would be fairly simple to include a, a five question short acculturation scale. Um, Art, do you want to take the next question? Sure. Thank you for this uh, interesting talk. I wonder if you have any data looking at uh, membership in communities of faith uh, as one item, and the other is whether the individuals are part of a more traditional family uh, structure. I think part of the acculturation topic is uh, joining a uh, secularization trend in our country, which may not be supportive of healthy um, health habits. Yeah, great question. And actually, the the Hispanic Community Health Survey, the study of Latinos, has very detailed uh, data on this on really religiosity, uh, familismo, and all those factors that you mentioned. And there actually are validated ways to to study that. And it turns out it's not as all the acculturation studies is not like every acculturation signal results in as you get more acculturated, um, you get worse health outcomes, because it turns out that a higher acculturation is also associated with some potential beneficial things, right? So it'd be a higher education, higher income. So it's not a whole, it's not a one to one correlation. And, and unfortunately, there's no simple answer. It's not this is true for this group all the time. So I think it depends on the metrics studied. Um, we have to capture the data. And so far, the soul study, and NHANES actually has pretty good data too, but those are probably the best data sources. We don't routinely capture this in, in uh, you know, clinical databases. Great. And um, I'll read um, Oyiri Onuma's question from the chat. Um, she says, thank you, Fatima. That was excellent. Um, how do we practically address the heterogeneity in Hispanic populations in clinical work? Should we be actively asking subpopulations of Hispanic individuals um, what their um, ancestry is and should we be use, utilizing that? And then a second question is, how does the immigration status and access to care or lack thereof play into the paradox? Great, great questions. Um, and the data that I showed, some healthcare systems do disaggregate by country of origin and major, not only Hispanic, but also Asian subgroups. So Sutter Health actually does that. Latha Panyapan had led efforts to do that when she was at Sutter. Uh, Kaiser is, is starting to do that because again, noting the significant differences in, in risk factors by, by these populations. So I think that yes, we, we should, when you, you know, the more granular, the better, we have to collect the data. We've tried to do this for the registry, the AHA, ACC registries, but if people are, are extracting this from the electronic health record, Afterwards, that's a lot more difficult than if we ask the the patient, you know, right right off the bat. And I think your your, your next question was immigration studies. A huge so obviously the the question about immigration studies plays a huge role into into this because we may be missing data. People may be nervous if they're illegal to provide data for the census. And NHANES again in their efforts to oversample does a pretty good job at again assuring people that this data won't be used against them. Immigration, the, the salmon bias for the paradox, saying that some individuals go back to their country of origin to, to die, and that's why we see these, these lower mortality rates. Um, that's actually, it's not necessarily true for some populations. For example, for Cuban individuals, they couldn't go back because there was, there was legal reasons they couldn't go back. So those numbers were not likely undercounted. And again, there's been some follow-up data showing that that is unlikely to explain the paradox because they're still being counted in the, in the death numbers. Um, you know, I wanted to ask just a follow on to the, um, to the uh, risk scores that, and looking at the, um, whether or not to include race and ethnicity in those, in those risk scores. Um, you know, if we don't have a biological plausibility for um, race or ethnicity, which I think we can collectively say is true, 
And at least that without disaggregating the Hispanic uh, group, we certainly end with the paucity of data in genetics. We really don't have a, a biological plausibility. Um, how do you propose that we move forward? We see how they modify the risk scores, and yet they still are, you know, still a mainstay in how we decide who gets statin therapy, who doesn't get statin therapy, and a whole host of other risk reductive strategies. Or um, we have a student working with us who's looking at the STS score. So that's um, maybe determining who gets surgery or doesn't get surgery based on their risk. How do you, how do you propose we um, reconcile where we are now and where we should be going? That's a great question and, and completely agree that these are all social contra constructs, right? And we, again, in the Hispanic populations are so much more heterogeneity within that group. What I would say is that it, it is a helpful, that I think race, ethnicity are really helpful proxies for everything else that we're not measuring. So it's very valuable to, unless we had a perfect social determinants of health, structural experiences, lived experiences, discrimination, we had all of that available, get rid of race, ethnicity, but we don't. And it's gonna be very hard to do that systematically. So I think it's it's valuable to understand per an individual's self-identified race and ethnicity because that's part of their lived experiences. And for risk scores, I think for something like the pull forward equation where you're deciding statin therapies and it's overestimating, maybe that's obviously less dangerous than if you're talking about something like kidney transplant allocation or, or, or surgical risk factors. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult, but I think that, that we should, should still collect it, whether we need to use it in a risk scores, it depends on what, what, what the risk score is and what's at stake, I think. Thanks. Harlan, do you wanna? Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to uh, convey my thanks that you got up so early to give us grand rounds and for such an uh, illuminating topic, uh, illuminating this particular topic is, is hard. And I'm just thinking about the kind of tools that we can generate that can be helpful in practice. I mean, ultimately, this surrounds the issues of structural racism and social determinants. And, and as, as you're suggesting, and I think rightly making the point about this immense heterogeneity, you know, it, it really does, these labels are so imprecise. And so the, the, really the question is, how can we begin to to characterize properly our patients and understand what specific interventions may be helpful to, to enable them to achieve the best outcomes possible for them, given their preferences and values. And, you know, I, I just, as I'm listening to you, I'm just both daunted by it uh, and, and also kind of excited by the notion that maybe someone like you can lead to these kind of tools that, that we can think practically, how do we apply them in practice and and, and, and by the way, this thing about the paradox, I mean, we've struggled with this, like, you know, because you know that there are individuals who are struggling in the system, who are, who are getting lost, who are having trouble being matched with the kind of care that they really need. So regardless of what these averages look like, there, there are lots of people who, because of the way our system is set up, are encountering strong headwinds and whose health suffers as a result. And so, you know, it, it's really a matter of trying to figure, I think, figure this out. Like what's, a, what's acceptable to patients? What's acceptable within our systems? And then how do we not just make assumptions about people, but actually have them participate in their own, in, in identifying their barriers and working with us to, as we work as partners to overcome them? Anyway, these are just some of the things on my mind about as you do it, like how we move from descriptive to prescriptive and then how do we do it in a way that respects and honors our patients' privacy and preferences and individuality, but at the same time matches you know, our help with their needs in ways that are likely to help potentiate their, their best health outcomes. Anyway, you, you've stimulated me to think about- that's, that's, I mean, those, I spent a lot of time as you know, thinking about this. And I think what you're getting to is also this, this notion of cultural humility, right? We've moved away from cultural competence. Like we can, when I was in med school, they're like, these patients need this, this is a patient needs it. And no, you have no idea. Uh, and again, all the patients that I see from, from diverse Asian backgrounds, like there's, there's all, you know, give the same talk around Asian health, right? There's model minority, but that's, that's absolutely not true across every patient that we encounter in, in clinical practice. And a lot of it is just not making assumption. Like you say, like, what are, what are your preferences? Who do you want in the exam room? Who do you want to help you? And, and the, the language piece, I think, is a very practical one for us, for our clinicians. And as we think about telehealth, 
um, and making it making it easy for people to be able to connect in these visits and have the care that they need. Because I've personally, even being a Spanish speaking provide, uh, physician, I see that uh, patients are having a hard time connecting to video visits. But part of it is just because they're like, oh, I can't do that. I just too crazy. But if, if I take an extra step of having the medical assistant call them and help them set up, it's pretty amazing. And then the other thing is that you couldn't list people the, the tools that are helpful that people may already have that you may not think about. Again, this patient that I saw last week, there's some young guy, you know, showing me all his her medications on, on video. And I was like, who is this guy? And I was like, oh, he must be your grandchild. And she's like, no, he was just like a, a, guy, a neighbor walking by. And he said, you seem like you needed help. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, so some people may have protective factors that we're underutilizing and we should you know, keep that in, in mind as we develop these interventions. Thank you. Um, Aria, do you want to take the last question? <clears throat> sure. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed this enlightening uh, talk uh, about the cardiovascular benefit and you know, mortality benefit among the Hispanic population. When you go back to the, you know, and you try to see if there is any genetic factor involved, when you look at back to the country of origin, they, you don't see that benefit. Cardiovascular mortality appears to be the same in Mexico as is here. And the question is that there is something special about those who migrated here. And, you know, you touch based on a lot of factors, but I wonder actually physical activity, because the part of the jobs they are involved in may actually require more phys being active physically, whether being in the farm or you know, construction and stuff. I don't know if you can study that as well to see actually that there is actually some uh, some benefit through that. Yes, that's a great question. So that's one of the commonly held notions is like there's just a healthy migrant. You're having people that are coming to, you know, do these physical labors. And it turns out that also is not true across the board. So they, they actually did one of the population health services. They actually did that. They like measure cardiorespiratory fitness and all these things. Uh, um, and it turns out that their the health status was not better. And not only was it not better, it declined pretty quickly after coming here. And we can imagine again, the social situations that people right. lived in when they live here. Even if you have a very physical job, um, if you're eating poorly, you know, not sleeping, all the other things, it, it counters. So again, I think that those are tend to be the younger populations. And we will see that this is all older data. For the, for the older population, some of it is that they're being brought with their family, right? You bring like the, the, the older relatives. But yeah, I think that's one of the possibilities and it probably doesn't explain the whole story, but great, great point. And also a comment I want to say about the principal component analysis that you showed. And, uh, and the question that actually Erica asked about, you know, polygenic risk scoring. Actually, I was quite encouraged to see there is significant overlap between whites and Hispanic. The outlier were blacks actually, <clears throat> completely different PCA. Uh, and actually among the more Mexican and other that you showed, there was actually very much similarity in the principal component analysis. So maybe actually polygenic risk scoring can be used, although we have to do a studies more in, the, in this population. Yes, and, and the work, the, the, this project that's going to be published in circulation by my colleague, Sho Clark, shows that the performance of the polygenic risk scores is very similar among Hispanic individuals that is in non-Hispanic uh, non white. So yes, absolutely. Terrific. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Rodriguez. It's terrific to hear this talk. Very provocative. And I think we learned a ton and have a charge before us to um, improve our patient's health, recognizing uh, the individuality of each person. Um, Dr. Bender, did you want to give a closing remark? Uh, no, I, I didn't really have a okay. closing remark. I was going to clap, but I just want, I guess I'll make one additional genetic point, which is the opportunity to look at extreme clinical phenotypes in genetics and the resilience phenomenon is really important. Um, and, and I know I, I learned from, from Rick Lifton, former uh, chair of genetics here, that looking at extreme phenotypes is some way, some, in some, sometimes a way to get at more common genetic variants. So if you have a population, I mean, you can talk about paradox, but a population who has an unbelievable extensive array of risk factors and seems to be extremely resilient and, and, and keeps cooking along like you're, you're the patient you described, that would, that's a very important population to study.
and your colleague whom you've mentioned several times. Yeah, probably. Herman Taylor is doing that. I think it for for black individuals, yeah. you know, yeah. for he says for the one for but we, yeah, we and I think that that's a great point that I'll talk to with the Soul Study Group because if people are doing much better than expected, there may be something worth investigating there. I agree. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's it's an honor to see everybody, so many friends and colleagues from from many stages in my in my career, and and uh, look forward to seeing you again.